We are back, everyone. So for the second half of class, we talk about futurism. We move to Italy. If German expressionism, the first half of class, was about getting into the future by looking to the past, folklore art, children, um, uh, animals, quote-unquote primitive, primitive art, everything that we talked about from the De Blau writer Almanac, uh, the futurists just basically wanted to destroy everything to get to the future. Uh, so destroy the past to get to um, the future. Uh, still in some circles a seductive idea. Um, we'll talk. Maybe we'll talk about why it's actually a problematic idea. Um, but futurism, Italy. So with futurism we start with the manifesto because it's still probably the most famous uh, component of the movement. And it was written by a poet who is basically the impresario, the leader of the, the futurists, uh, in 1909. And it was written, um, pardon me, it was published in Le Figaro. So this is, he's Italian. Most of these artists of the futurists are Italian, but it was published in French uh, in Le Figaro. And this is, just stop for a moment and think how crazy this is. This is the equivalent of uh, an artist. Uh, or an artist group today publishing a, a, a statement about art, society, and politics on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. I think it's really that big. Uh, it's it's quite incredible. Um, it would never happen today. Um, likely would never happen. Um, so it's 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 just an incredible an incredible moment, and it already tells you so much about the movement itself. The fact that Marinetti wanted to reach the masses through uh, the medium of the of the of the journal of the newspaper. So there it is. There's the manifesto um, on the front page, and we want to talk about some key themes of of the manifesto. Uh, which will tell us a lot, a lot about the movement and the ambitions this movement had. So first of all, like I was just saying, Futurism wanted established uh, the avant-garde's connection to mass culture. Um, slowly but surely over the summer, we're gonna, over the semester, we're going to be talking about what avant-garde means. But it, it's especially, uh, it resonates especially well with the Futurists because avant-garde comes from, it's a military term, so the troops that are in the front, avant-garde, uh, the troops in the front, who are guarding the front. But it also has a metaphoric resonance within the arts, in that these are the artists who are pushing the envelope. These are the artists that are at the front of creativity and, and moving art in different, newer directions. So futurism, you're going to see, encompasses both. They're trying, although they're not that successful, in pushing the envelopes of art, uh, the envelope of, of creativity and art, you'll see they rely on established movements already. But in the other realm, uh, the realm of the militaristic and the political, they are actually, um, they, they're going to take it quite literally, um, as you're going to see. So that's the avant-garde as a term. Again, it will snowball over the, over the semester, <clears throat> and by the end of it, you'll know exactly um, what this very rich, complex term of the avant-garde <clears throat> means. Um, so he wanted to establish the avant-garde in connection to mass culture. So this is really new, right? Because uh, before this, artists, yes, they would write, uh, and of course they would show works in public spaces like galleries, um, and then and then there would be reviews in, in journals and that sort, that sort of thing. But you, ha you haven't yet have an artist who goes directly to um, the populace, directly into the public sphere through writing um, in a newspaper. In mass production, um, in fact, mass production is usually thought to be the opposite of elite fine art. Where fine art, you have these discrete objects that are valuable, and then mass publications are just popular art. They're not really, they're not really art. So this is a big shift. This tells you that Marinetti and the Futurists wanted to reach as many people as they could, and that's because they had very revolutionary ambitions um, encoded in their art and in their politics. That's the the big takeaway that you need to know about futurism. It's above all a political um, avant-garde, and unfortunately it's inherently um, fascistic, which we'll talk about in a second. So from its name, I think you can tell that futurism is about the, the future, and how do you get to the future with futurism? Um, I think you still have people that are named futurologists today um, who are interested in in, in technologies and um, usually like techno-utopian spaces and that sort of thing. 
um, futurism was connected to a fusion of artistic practices with advanced forms of technology. So for them, in fact, technology um, and industry um, was more important than art as traditionally understood. So one of the most famous lines from the Futurist Manifesto is a speeding automobile is more beautiful than the victory of Smothrace. Uh, the victory of Smothrace, you see it here, it's a really famous Hellenistic statue that's in the Louvre that Marinetti would have seen in Paris. Um, and there he is in his car, um, in his automobile. And so he says that, that the automobile, this engine, um, uh, is more beautiful than what most people would traditionally think is is the more beautiful object in uh, the Hellenistic statue. So this tells you a lot about the priorities of, of the futurists. They above all fetishized technology um, and speed. Um, the other thing, and this is where things get m much more clearly unfortunate for um, for futurism. Futurism is weird avant-garde. It's really the only one that aligned itself with right-wing politics, and by that I mean um, fascism, Mussolini's fascism in Italy. Marinetti was in fact a close friend of, of Mussolini. Um, and so in the manifesto, you're going to see themes of embracing war. This is right before World War I. And whereas most avant-garde movements that we talk about have a real foreboding um, and they're really dismayed at the fact that the world is about to go to war and in fact does go to war, many of them are killed. Franz Marc, very famously, he works on camouflage. He's one of the... Um, um, he worked on camouflage in uh, during the war and is killed during World War One. Futurism, on the other hand, loved war. Um, they embraced the oncoming war. Um, and they allowed themselves to be swept up by uh, fascism in politics of Italy. And fascism is a tricky term, and it's a term that, unfortunately, we're talking a lot about today because there are some signals and signs that our democracy um, in this country is turning more and more authoritarian, as it is in Brazil, as it is in other places in the world, um, uh, where things are starting to look a little bit um, uneasily like like um, symptoms of fascism. Really amazing historians have written uh, books about this um, actually since 2016. It's become uh, a, a word that, that's just come back from the past for us. And it's a very hard word to define, uh, but the way we're going to use it is that fascism um, is it's a few things. One, it's nationalistic. It is let's say here in this context, Italy first, right? Um, or make Italy great again. This is, this is one of the inherent features of fascism that you find in Italy. You're going to find it in Germany with National Socialism. Um, you'll find it in India. Uh, you'll find it in this country. You'll find it in Brazil, uh, in more, um, in, 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 our, uh, in, our in our time. But that's one of the central features of fascism, that it's interested in uh, a nationalism. And usually a nationalism based in military and police control, regimentation of society. Um, this, is, this is very um, um, uh, another key feature of, uh, of, of fascism. And so these are, these are some of the features that, that the futurists embraced uh, because they thought they could use uh, this this fascistic mobilization and politics and this war and this technology to just completely get rid of the past and start anew uh, a whole new revolutionary um, um, future based in um, um, in fascist rule so it's a problematic avant-garde um, here are a few quotes I won't read them all um, but you can, of course, always pause so that you can read parts of it. Uh, but it's a very famous primal scene of, of futurism where Marinetti was, um, was driving very fast and then he wrecked his car. And he flipped it into a ditch um, and he went flying. Um, and for most of us, this would be a horrible, traumatic moment in our lives. Um, but being the somewhat adrenaline junkie that he, that he seemed to be, Marinetti at least claimed that this was a, a, a great moment for him, a delicious moment of red hot uh, red hot joy um, <clears throat> so again this this idea that violence speed technology the automobile 
these are the things that we should prioritize and speed off into the future, um, into this um, energized uh, conception of the, the future. There's also uh, very clear and very unfortunate um, um, sentences in the manifesto where they glorify war. They call it a hygiene of the world. Um, so militarism, patriotism, um, anarchy, all those things actually don't fit well together. Uh, but they say that these are all good things that, that are worth dying for. Um, that they, it's going gonna, it's gonna to get rid of the world of the old regime and we're going to have a new world. Um, so it doesn't get much more revolutionary um, than, than that. Um, and also into the mix, like... Um, um, I'm sorry, also into the mix is uh, a contempt for women. So there's also this understanding that uh, uh, there's there's almost an anti-feminist gesture coded into the, the Futurist Manifesto, though some scholars um, debate this. Um, and again, they, they, they intend to detroy, destroy the past, which means quite literally destroying museums, libraries, universities, academies, so on and so forth. Um, and they're against any form of sort of weakness or weepiness um, or sentimentality. Um, so again, moralism, feminism, uh, all of this they, they deem to be a form of, of cowardice. Um, and and uh, they took this quite seriously, at least initially in the manifesto. They said basically once, once we hit 30, uh, we hope that the future futurist will then um, throw us away uh, into the wastebasket like, use, like useless manuscripts. So this is one way in which it's actually aligned with Die Brücke, um, although the politics are very different. They both want a new future. How they get there is very different. Um, and they both fetishize the youth, youthfulness, um, within, this whole, within this whole enterprise. So, that are, so those are some of the key themes um, from the Futurist Manifesto. But then, maybe more interestingly, is how did they deploy these themes in the works that they did um, and in some of their activities? So here they are. There's Marinetti, Boccioni, some of the other uh, painters and artists associated with futurism in a photograph. One of the things they did, they would hold what are, what are called serratas, which are evenings, futurist serratas. So these would be like theater. This would be people show up, they'd be up on the stage, um, and there would be various activities. Um, they would show uh, paintings, of course. They would recite futurist poems, um, which are often very m nonsensical and just purely phonetic and, um, and uh, disorienting. Um, but they would do all sorts of other things. Uh, so they would offer up produce, basically, to the crowds, to encourage the crowd to become engaged and throw stuff at them, throw stuff at each other. And they would do all sorts of other cheeky things, like uh, put glue on the seats, so that when people sit down and they, they get stuck and then they would get obviously uh, probably pissed off um, they would sell one ticket for an, they would sell like a few tickets for one seat so you can imagine what would happen there often these things would devolve into brawls people fighting uh, this is a this is a character of a futurist serata by Boccioni a really well known futurist painter and you can see people are like on stage uh, they seem to be fighting. It's just a, a, a total, total mayhem. Um, and then in the Dottori one, you show um, you know tomatoes and all sorts of stuff being thrown on stage. They invited this, right? They invited all these things. Um, they really wanted to not only engage the public but like jolt it violently into action. They wanted this kind of participation. Um, and in fact, uh, my my PhD advisor. Uh, has written uh, Claire Bishop. She's written sort of the definitive history of this kind of art, which is participatory art, where artists will use the public, will use everyday people um, as part of their work. Like the point of the work is for society to become engaged, to participate in this type of art. Um, and as she has it, this is one of those first movements, first set of artists that did this. So this is really forward-looking. Um, in it was in the service of their their futurist ideology, but nonetheless, this idea of incorporating and impl implicating the, the the public into a work of art is something that will have a lot of legs in the in the twentieth century. Um, and if you're interested in this, in the fall, I'm teaching a class just on participatory and socially engaged art. So sign up for that. It will be it should be um, a lot of fun uh, to go through that history. Um, and hopefully, we'll be 
um, in class again, um, and it's safe. Above all, it'll be safe to be back in class. Um, so th this is one way in which the futurists um, uh, put their ideas into action. And it wouldn't always be in theaters. They would also, they would just be out in public. Like there's a very famous instance of them standing uh, by the St. Mark's Cathedral in Venice and then making fun of people coming out of the church. Um, one of the things they'd want to destroy is religion and the church. And so they would like violently um, verbally abuse people, which again, as you can imagine, it ended up, you know, um, uh, upsetting a lot of people and they got into a fight, all right? Um, so I guess I like to joke that the futurists are kind of like the fight club of the, uh, of the historical avant-garde. Um, and today, unfortunately, Fight Club is a, is a fun film to watch from the 90s, but it has been adopted a little bit by the neo-fascist uh, right in our country. Um, but that's a whole other story. Okay, so those are some of the more cutting-edge activities. They were also painters and sculptors, but this is where things get a little weird because the futurists were above all about the future, about you know destroying museums, about technology, um, about youthfulness and all this stuff. But in fact, by 1912, in this example, uh, the way they made works, painting and sculptures, they weren't actually cutting-edge. What Picasso and Brock are doing at this very moment is way, way more advanced at the level of a pictorial language, at the level of art, um, than what the futurists do. So that's a little bit of, a, of an irony or paradox in futurism. So here's Giacomo Bala, one of the really more important early painters in the futurists. Um, he's kind of making fun of the bourgeois woman with her little dachshund, um, uh, her wiener dog. They're walking um, down the street. Uh, but he's also imbued it with a certain amount of dynamism and movement. He's also influ influenced by chronophotography, which we talked about a few sessions ago. So the feet are going in multiple spaces in time, and the little dog's feet are pitter-pattering. Um, so you get this sense of speed and the chain going, going by. So there's a little bit of making fun of the old, I would gather, um, and then also a little bit of showing speed um, and the use of or the recourse to chronophotography, to this kind of stop motion sense of movement. But overall, it's not really uh, that advanced of a, of a painting. Um, it's likable enough, but it doesn't feel like a cutting edge uh, painting. It feels like a bit of a letdown after all that belligerent, macho uh, rhetoric that we read in the Futurist uh, Manifesto. So here's Moybridge, an example of stop motion photography. Uh, this is the horse. Is a very, there's a very famous story that two guys bet uh, on on on, a, on horses, whether or not uh, when a horse is running, its legs ever, all four legs ever touch the ground, and there was no way to know this with the human eye until we had the, the invention of chronal photography, and then you could tell. Um, and it turns out horses never have four legs on the ground at the one time. So, whichever guy bet on that won the bet. Um, here are a couple more examples of Bala. Um, Girl running on a balcony. Again, this chrono photography kind of vibe with this, world, with this girl um, running along the picture. Uh, this is a little bit more, um, this seems that sli slightly more daring in the sense that he's using this kind of, you know, vaguely pointillistic method. Um, he's influenced by Seurat, he's influenced by Neo Impressionism. You see it here in the street light. But it's a type of pointillism or divisionism that seems to be. Uh, not so much about color theory, but more about imbuing the work with like electricity, um, um, as if you're getting an electric current or a body moving and being broken up, almost like uh, a colorful X-ray of some kind. So you do get this sense of technology or techno fetishism being deployed in these paintings um, in a way that might might be interesting. Um, and you get a quote that works well with these in another uh, manifesto. These guys wrote so many different manifestos. Um, the suffering of man is the same interest to us as the shrieking of an electric lamp, which can feel pain, suffer tremors, and shriek with the most heart-writing expressions of torment. So here you have, in very evocative language, a collapse of the human and the machine, a collapse of the human and the electric, um, which is a big theme um, in, in futurism. And you see it here in Boccioni's very famous statue, Unique Forms of Continuity in Space, from 1913. Also rather traditional, um, though you do get a sense of movement in the, in the statue. Um, this is kind of like a spaceman 
uh, but he's always he's also weirdly animal um, also kind of amphibious in some ways a lot of people note that um, but he's running off into the future maybe up into space um, in this brawn in this bronze casting and so this is a clear example of the futurist being interested almost in the cyborg um, the um, or the the man that, that's melded with machine technology um, and you're going to get this in the 20th century in so many different ways right in popular culture you have something like iron man um, i mean what a what a great example of the cyborg half man half machine um, this is, I think, the first the first uh, comic of it, and maybe from the 1939, so later. But um, you know, this idea of the cyborg, of of the human melding with machine, is very much a fut futurist uh, trope. One that we see. Uh, and just sometimes I'll plug more contemporary examples. Ones that we see uh, a lot of, a lot of today. Um, so Alex Gar Garland is a wonderful filmmaker. Um, he directed Ex Machina in 2015. If you've never seen it, it's really quite good. Definitely this sort of, this, this futurist tale. Um, I might be spoiling a little bit here. So, Paul, if you're going to watch it and you don't want to, you don't want the spoil, uh, just pause and fast forward 15, 20 seconds or something like that. Uh, but here you have an AI that's created by a guy um, who's very thinly based on Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, and then the AI ends up... Um, overtaking him and, and uh, eventually killing him um, in a much more feminist version of nonetheless a futurist parable of technology of the future overtaking um, overtaking um, um, humanity um, and the old guard. Um, so the, the, the futurists are like the techno-utopians um, that litter Silicon Valley today who think that the, the future is a technocratic one, one in which some transhumanists even think that we might be able to upload our minds into a computer and then that's going to be the new way of living. Um, and that is, if not futurist, I don't know. I don't know what is, right? So, um, The political aspect of this is also interesting um, and also current. So you do have some thinkers today, even some artists, who call themselves accelerationists, um, who are within this history of, of politics as futurist. Um, and the idea is that things are not bad enough yet for the f to get to the future. Things have to go way worse um, for us to get to the future. And so an accelerationist will try to make things worse in order to, for things to get better. We'll, we'll destroy, um, we'll egg on destru destructive energies in society in order to get to a, a better society. So that too is futurist in sentiment, in ideology. And there's a wonderful history of this type of thinking. If you're interested, Benjamin Noyes, he wrote a book called Milan Velocities, and it's not a coincidence. He begins with the futurists for this history. So that's why I put that in there for you. Um, then the futurists are also interested in the crowd. Um, so you may or may not know this, but fascism itself, the term comes from fasci, which is an old Latin term uh, for a bundle of sticks. And so the idea is that one stick you can break easily, but if you put all these sticks together in a bundle, in a fasci, it's very hard to break. So f fascism is inherently um, a mode of governance where people, where the individual is subordinate to the group. To the collective, um, this is its only real similarity with communism, um, which which also believes more, and socialism, which also believes more in solidarity in various forms, where the group um, um, is usually prioritized over the individual. But in fascism, the group is kept in check by a police state, by the military, and by a fuhrer, by an uh, um, um, uh, by a dictator, by an authoritarian ruler. And so the futurists were also interested in less maybe the individual, but in manipulating the public, as we already talked about, and, and using the energies of the crowd. And they're influenced by contemporary theories of, of the crowd. Um, and I don't know if anybody has ever been at a big protest, ever been in a big crowd, but there is a certain mentality that kicks in, for better and then sometimes for worse, um, where you have almost like a crowd mob mentality, right? Um, which again can be used for good, and we're seeing a lot of it right now being used for good. 
Uh, but we can also see it for bad, where certain people will do things that they wouldn't do otherwise if they were just by themselves. It's as if the energy and the anonymity of the crowd allows certain people um, to energize certain things, and then it has a ripple effect. So it makes so much sense that the futurist would have been interested in the crowd and tried to tap into the energies of the crowd. And you see it in a work like Carlo Caro's Interventionist Demonstration from 1914. Here you see the futurists being influenced by synthetic cubism and by papier collé and by collage. So they would have seen, they would travel to Paris and they would have seen Picasso and Brock and this would very quickly influence their visual production. Um, and so the Carl, uh, Carlo Caro's intervention demonstration is a collage, a set of newspaper cuttings. Um, you get this sense of a swirl, almost like a whirlpool of text with all these different uh, sounds being emitted, some from sports, some from politics, some are just like onomatopoeias, uh, things that sound like gunfire. Um, and so what he's trying to do here is imitate what it feels like to be in a crowd with all this cacophonous, all these voices, all these sounds from the city, uh, automobiles and so on and so forth. All of these things are emanating and creating this cacophonous energy uh, that's emanating from the center of the vortex of this painting outwards. Um, uh, some people also note that there's a bit of, well, two things. One, there's definitely certain fascist uh, and nationalistic sentiments in here. You see it with Italia here, Italy and the flag. You see it with the sound of gunfire um, and the political speech that you're seeing. But you might also see it represented by uh, the front of an airplane and this being like a large propeller. So the crowd almost becomes the front of an airplane and this propeller that's coming out at you. And here is where we come full circle to one of the, one of the first things I said about futurism, which it was its embracing of war and technology and ultimately World War I, Mussolini and, and fascism. Um, and this is, a, this is a difficult story, right? We're gonna talk a lot about World War I with uh, with with the movements that 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 we that are coming up very soon, especially Dada, every movement was despised the war, and they blamed um, those in power for the war. They were vehemently against um, um, the bourgeoisie and the authoritarian leaders that led to war, according to um, according to to these, these movements. But futurism, no. In fact, Marinetti enlisted for the army and went to the front and started writing about all the violence and death and more that he saw. Um, so th these guys didn't only uh, write about this and make work about it, they embraced it. Like they really went to war um, and they thought that, that this would lead to an ultimate revolution in, in society. Um, we see this in a work by Severini, Armored Train in Action, 1915, uh, this kind of cubo-futurist work that's glorifying war. Um, so it's this train with a cannon and soldiers. Um, this actually comes from a photograph that would have been in a newspaper at the time of Italian soldiers um, um, during, during the war. So the, the futurists embrace the war and embrace uh, fascism as a revolutionary energy um, to catastrophic ends. World War I is the first major cat catastrophe of the 20th century um, and unfortunately I wish I could say otherwise but it's it's not the biggest one. There, there are worse ones to come. Um, and so at some point Marinetti even tries to run to become Mussolini's cultural advisor um, in 1919. So this is going even further. An artist trying to become a politician, collapsing politics and art together. This is another key definition of the avant-garde. So avant-garde artists not being satisfied with simply making works of art, but they want to make works of art that actually become political and they actually do become, uh, and they actually do have a say and have power within the political landscape. In this, in this instance, a very fascistic, nationalistic one of Mussolini's um, Italy. And so we're going to end on this question because it's a big question for um, for our whole class. And it's actually still a big question for us today, in, in, in a way. Uh, but definitely for the historical avant-garde that we're studying this semester of early 20th century art. Um, should art 
simply be satisfied with um, situating itself within a public sphere, um, which usually when we're talking about art, this is like a pretty elite bourgeois public sphere. Like, you know, we can all go to museums, but let's be honest, that culture is still in many ways um, guarded by uh, a moneyed class, right? Um, and so are artists satisfied with their works being um, um, held in those type of spaces? Or should an artist actually exceed those spaces and start going out into, a mass, into the mass cultural sphere? Should an artist even be involved with politics at all, right? Um, I mean, I think a lot of us maybe um, it's, it's, it's become all too clear that let's say like a celebrity should probably not I mean, it's, it's probably the case that most celebrities would be really bad as a politician, as politicians. Um, might not always be the case, but for the most part, a celebrity, not so great as a politician. Um, um, we might have a perfect test case of this uh, in these past few years. But then on the other side, do we really want an artist uh, to have cultural, political power? Um, should artists really be 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 in politics at all, um, or should they just be sort of informing the public discourse? Um, this is a key question for the avant-garde, a key key question for artists. Again, still today, um, any artist that has ambitions of, in some ways, making work or contributing to uh, a mass cultural public sphere of politics, of society, of social engagement, is inherently running certain risks. Um, um, that, are, that, are, that are really fruitful to, to, to discuss. So we'll leave it at that for futurism. Um, and then um, um, that's the end of this session. So I'll see you for the next one. Take care, everybody.